Okay, we're in uh, Revelation chapter 10. We're going to uh, go ahead and start the tape, but we're going to give just a little bit of, um, of review and background to bring us up to date. We've gone through the uh, seven seals, and, uh, and part of that uh, seven seals, I had a question uh, from um, uh, Diana with regard to this particular uh, uh, painting, uh, the picture that we have. And um, at first, uh, seeing it from the distance, uh, she wasn't sure exactly what it is. And uh, what this is has to do with uh, what they call in painting faceless throngs. And that is a, a painter comes up and he puts like a little head and a little body and then puts a whole lot of them uh, together. Uh, and uh, it's to give the impression that there are a lot of people in a small area. Uh, a lot of times they'll do that. You know, they'll have a, a, a foreground with like a baseball, uh, a batter and the catcher and umpire. And in the, in the back, they'll have the faceless throng there. And that's what this is. And it has to do with the contrast of two major groups in uh, the tribulation. In the first half of the tribulation, the one lower on the earth there pictures the 144,000. Uh, I'm sorry? Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. Need to, don't know where. There, here we go. These, these here. <laughs> Uh, those are uh, 12,000 uh, apiece of the 12 tribes. And uh, they're assembled there on the earth. And of course, they are taken up and off uh, the earth in the midway point and brought back after the tribulation is over uh, to start the kingdom. And that's what we're going to be discussing this coming Sunday. Uh, and that is where these uh, 144,000 Jewish male virgins uh, get their bride. Uh, whenever the kingdom comes. They don't have glorified bodies. Now there will be those who have resurrected glorified bodies. Abraham, Isaac, you know, the apostle Peter, on we go. But these guys won't. And it has to do with the multiplication clause of the Abrahamic covenant. But anyway, <clears throat> the contrast is those in uh, heaven. There is a great multitude there, which no man can number. Now, the, the first one, we numbered them, 144,000. Uh, and they were all Jews, 12,000 of each tribe. But here you have of all nations, and they come out of the great tribulation. The 144,000 are in the first part or the beginning of sorrows of the tribulation period. Uh, the, uh, the mighty throng that we have in heaven, uh, the numberless throng there, uh, comes out of the great tribulation or the last half of that seven year period. And so this particular drawing um, contrasts these two groups. And another thing, they're there in their souls without a body. And we have, have studied exactly what God does. Rather than giving them a body at that particular time, he gives them a white terry cloth robe, all the snaps to it and so forth. And that's a, a robe of righteousness. Uh, and they live in that until they are resurrected. So these are the two groups and their contrast. All right, secondly... Then, as uh, we're proceeding, we began looking at um, the seven angels that are the trumpeters. Now, just like there were seven seals, now there are seven angels. And in fact, from this point onward, the angels take over the dispensing of the judgment of God. Now, it's interesting in this particular dispensation that they don't handle that part of it. Uh, in other dispensations, they are guardians or judges. Uh, and uh, the angels um, uh, are actually the ones that are going to sound these trumpets and pour out the seven vials upon the earth. Uh, and they are associated with judging the earth. And uh, the reason being uh, the angelic conflict, uh, all the focus is upon the earth. But in this dispensation, they only observe... Now, it doesn't mean they don't do their other ministry behind the scenes and so forth. But they are not guardians to the church, nor do they uh, dispense judgment. 
it's directly from God himself, especially through God, the Holy Spirit. Uh, so the, the angels are observers in this dispensation. In fact, uh, that's what I think I'm going to speak on down at the conference, impacting angels. We've touched on it before, but we're going to go into a lot more uh, detail in the short time we have. But uh, impacting angels. Um, and uh, when you talk about the body of Christ, we cause the angels to stir both good and bad. Uh, we cause uh, the angels, the bad ones, to be just a little bit anxious about uh, some things. We cause the good ones to understand the plan and program of God. Uh, unlike any other believers in any other time in history, the church, which is the body of Christ, can, can move the hearts of angels. Uh, and so that's uh, something we'll be talking about in uh, the conference and in the future. Okay. But what we're going to do tonight is look at a special angel. We're, we're going to literally take him apart uh, and see every facet and every aspect of him. Now, uh, if you would uh, look at verse number one. John says, I saw another mighty angel. Now, the other angels are given us here, for example, in uh, verse number one of chapter nine, talks about the fifth angel sounding, and he saw a, a great star fall from heaven and so forth. Verse one and two there. Uh, now, this particular uh, angel, and we know it's an angel if you turn to Revelation chapter uh, 20. We can call this a jailer angel or the warden, perhaps, of the prison in the center of the earth. And that's exactly what Jesus said when he talked about Hades. Hades is a three compartment area uh, in the center of the earth. It has the torments on one side, it has paradise on the other side, and it has Tartarus in the middle. But it is a confined space with gates that have locks on them. Uh, and so that's why he said the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church, meaning uh, that that Satan, who had the keys of death and hell up to the, the crucifixion and resurrection, could not prevent Christ from getting those keys back and releasing Satan's prisoners. But now here's the other side of it. Because Jesus Christ has those keys, he can keep prisoners in uh, hell and, and Tartarus, in torments and Tartarus, until the great white throne, when he unlocks those and death and hell come from um, the, um, the middle of the earth. Now we know that this is an angel, because in verse number one of chapter 20, it says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. So this is a jailer angel. Angels have lives. They have functions. They have ministries. They have duties. Uh, not all angels are alike. Now let's uh, go back here to chapter 8. And verse number 6. These are ministering angels in the temple and uh, uh, one of their ministries, of course, is to play the trumpet, whether it's in praise to God or uh, if it's to sound an alarm or to bring about uh, one of the seven trumpet judgments. So verse number six, and the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. And we went through uh, some time back and saw the judgment of the thirds, third of the sea, third of the freshwater, third of the sun, and on and on they go, third of humanity uh, with these um, opening trumpet judgments. So that's why he says here in verse 1 of chapter 10 again, I saw another angel. But he uses a, an interesting Greek word. It's not uh, hamas, another angel of the same kind. It's alos, an angel of a different kind. Now, generically speaking, they're all angels. But he's talking about an angel with a different function. Something special that God is asking uh, uh, him to do. He's different than the jailer angel. He's different than the herald angels that we'll see in just a little bit. He's different from the trumpeting angels, though all of them are angels. 
This one uh, is, is going to be different in uh, how he appears and what he does. Okay, so note verse number three, where the other angels trumpeted loudly, it says this one cried with a loud voice. So immediately we uh, uh, should understand that this is one of the herald angels. Uh, theologically, we call it an angel from the College of Heralds. Now, a college is a body of person that has common duties or, or share some common peculiarity or ministry or what have you. And that's why they're called a College of Heralds. But he is one of the mighty ones, and we'll look at that in just one moment. But are there other herald angels? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, for example, who told John the Baptist that he was going to be a father shortly down the line? Gabriel. Gabriel is a herald angel. That same angel told or heralded or proclaimed a message to Mary and said, uh, you're going to be the mother of the Lord here in just about nine months. Uh, and so one who communicates a message directly to humanity from God is a herald or of the college of heralds. Uh, Turn with me to the book of Luke, chapter 2. This will give you your Christmas fix. You'll say, Pastor, surely you'll have to say something about Christmas. It's so far away, the effects will wear off between now and then. Chapter 2 and verse number 8. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came uh, upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And the angel said, Fear not, behold, I bring to you glad tidings of great joy. This is a herald angel. God specifically sent him from heaven to earth to these men in the field to tell them of the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, as they uh, did this, in verse number 11, Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, told him of the sign. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying glory to God and the like. So it came to pass that when the angels were done with their proclamation and singing, they were gone away from them into heaven. These are herald angels, and uh, their special duty and ministry is to stand in the presence of God and get information from God. And they are sent to certain ones to deliver that. Now, we might call them literally crier angels. Turn to the uh, Revelation 14. And you'll remember that's what this guy does. He comes from heaven to earth. He assumes a posture and an attitude. And he raises his voice and he cries out. Herald angels are criers. Now you'll remember in ancient uh, days, I, I, didn't, I didn't live them, but maybe some of you did, when they had a town crier. And the town crier would, would come and uh, he would either have a scroll or a bell or some way of gathering the townspeople from the countryside to the center of town. And he would say, hear ye, hear, hear ye. And he would give the declaration of the king. Uh, and so that's what these are. These are crier angels or herald angels. Note in Revelation 14, verse 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And then it tells what he said. And then verse number 8. And another angel saying, and again he proclaimed. And then verse number 9, the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and receive his mark, he is going to be cast into the lake of fire. So this particular guy is from that college of heralds. He is a crier and he has a message to say to those of the earth. Now, uh, come back to chapter 10, verse 1.
And it says, uh, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven. Now you'll recall the first part of the book of Revelation. In chapter 4, uh, John was being talked to by the Lord. Then all of a sudden, from this point on, he says, A door was opened in heaven, and a voice said, Come up hither. So up he went. And he immediately saw uh, the throne of God and a rainbow around that throne uh, and the activities there in what we call command central. Uh, this is where the buck stops. This is the Supreme Court. This is the sovereign headquarters of God himself. No one is higher. Uh, no one gives uh, any more powerful decrees than God himself in this place. This angel and the way that he is dressed indicates that he came right from the presence of God with a, uh, an important message. Okay? But now, uh, note the word mighty. It's iskoros. Now, iskoros is um, a very important word because it means possessing a unique combination of strength and skill or to be imposing in size. You can have a, a power and you can have strength, but when you use this word, it's combined to make him a very fierce, cunning, skillful warrior. And one whose size is such uh, that uh, it is intimidating to the other angels. Remember uh, the size of Goliath, nearly 10 feet tall? And he challenged the whole armies of Israel well, until this little shepherd boy had this sling, you know, and uh, until he was killed. But he was intimidating to all others. And that's what this guy is. His, he, is he is massive. He is big. But coupled with that, he is not a dumb lineman. He, 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 he knows some things and he can, you know, uh, uh, carry the ball if, if need be and, and learn his plays. I can speak of a dumb, dumb lineman because uh, I was one uh, way back when. I've gained some smarts then. Maybe not too much, but I have. All right. Let's go then to Daniel chapter 10. And if any of you played, played ball, you can't say, Pastor, speak for yourself. Yeah, that's okay, too. Daniel chapter 10. Now, you'll remember in our study of the levels of the angels that these levels represent understanding, perception, skill, and power, and the combinations uh, of that. And this particular angel was created uh, with, with all this in mind, and he was set over most of them. Now, most of the other angels. Chapter 10, verse number 12. Then said he, an angel unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you did set your heart to understand and to chasten yourself before God, your words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia, this is another angel behind the scenes, uh, and we have fallen angels that stand for nations. Uh, and they will especially uh, uh, be uh, uh, relevant and uh, active during the uh, tribulation period. But this prince, note, he withstood me one and twenty days. In other words, he was a fallen angel that was big and powerful and skillful. And Daniel had prayed three weeks earlier, but this angel was immediately dispatched. But he wasn't strong enough to get past the king of Persia, meaning this angel who stood in his way. So what did he have to do? He had to radio back. <laughs> Will you send me somebody more powerful? So Michael, one of the chief princes, uh, one of these uh, Iskaros angels, uh, came to help me and I remained there with the kings. Come down to uh, verse 20. Knowest thou wherefore I come to thee, and now we return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I'm gone forth, the prince of Greece is going to come. There's going to be a big battle. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. But there's none that holdeth with me in these things. But Michael, your prince. In other words, I've got to go back here and fight with them. Uh, but about the only one that's going to be equal in this strength and cunning and smarts and uh, uh, 
is uh, Michael, the archangel. So this guy was on an equal plane, as it were, with Michael. Okay, let's come back. And let's note how he is dressed. It says that this angel had a rainbow on his head, verse 1, and he was clothed with a cloud. Now, these uh, two things are very, very important in their symbolism, especially for the nation of Israel. Whenever we talk about a rainbow, we're talking about light through a prism. White light carries all the colors of the rainbow, but unless it hits a prism or hits something that can reflect it, the colors uh, remain hidden. But as soon as they hit that, then they are displayed in the rainbow. And this, of course, uh, this rainbow around the throne of God uh, emphasizes that this white light, God is light in him is no darkness at all. But this white light, as it's, as it's coming through the, the cloud, uh, is dispersed into all these colors. And the individual colors are the virtues or attributes of God in their perfection, uh, as they are spawned from the source of this white light. So uh, this man comes directly from the throne room and represents the promises and the character of God. And as he's clothed in this cloud, uh, set against judgment. Now let's get some documentation on this by going back to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9. And this will show us the symbolism of, of this rainbow around his head and this cloud that he's dressed with. Verse number 11, I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more but the waters of a flood. God says, this is the token of the covenant between me and you for perpetual generations. Verse 13, I do set my bow in the cloud. It shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. Uh, and that's going to mean that I promise with all of my character backed up that I will not judge the earth in this fashion again. So uh, all of us understand the symbolism, the typology of a storm coming, a storm's brewing. And we can use that whether it's for the actual weather or, or trouble ahead. Seems that a storm is brewing. And we mean these, these dark uh, uh, gray uh, rain-filled clouds are beginning to accumulate. And so that symbolizes God's judgment. But when you put a rainbow on it, it means his judgment is satisfied and his character is, is seen in that he's not going to judge any longer. Or, uh, on the other hand, he can judge as well. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 13. It just depends on the setting Exodus 13. And verse number 21. And the Lord went before them by day in the pillar of cloud to lead them in the way, or by night in the pillar of fire to give them light to go by day or night. And he took not away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night. So the Shekinah glory could be a star or fire, or it could be a cloud. And that cloud represented the presence of God or the capability of God to judge. Now, nowhere do we find this better illustrated than in chapter 19 of this same book. And verse number nine. When God gave the law, he was talking about his judgments. Keep the law and there will be no judgment. Break the law 
and the cloud symbolizes the fact that there is potential judgment coming. And by the way, uh, both are, uh, uh, can be promises of God. Verse number nine. It says, And the Lord spoke to Moses and said, Lo, I come unto you in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak and believe thee forever. And by the way, it was a, it, it was a, a, a black cloud so that the people could not gaze through and see God, but they could realize his presence because the cloud was there. Now, the very same thing is true of this particular angel. He is dressed with this rainbow, indicating the character of God, and he's dressed with that which uh, means God's judgment. Do bad, he will judge. Do good, he won't judge. In this particular case, uh, God is going to judge. So let's go back to Revelation. Revelation chapter 10, verse number 1. Now the reason we're taking so much time with, with this fellow is because he is important. His decree or his declaration comes right before the middle part of the tribulation period. Uh, if you have three and a half years, he, he is about right here before the middle part. Uh, and so his decree is important because... As God promised he would not judge, this guy is going to kind of say God promises he will judge. And we've had all of these trials and tribulations and persecutions and, and, uh, and uh, environmental upheavals up to this point. And yet people will not repent and turn to God under the kingdom message. And so God says, that's fine. I'm going to send this mighty angel down. And we're going to start the midway point of the tribulation and bring in the great judgments that I have uh, promised. Okay, now let's look again in verse 1. Another mighty angel came down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head. And his face was, as it were, the sun. Now, please remember, we're under law here in the tribulation. And all of these things are pertinent and relevant to Israel and Israel's program. Turn just uh, one chapter over to chapter 12. Now, let's talk about this guy's face as the sun. Immediately, as a Jew reading this would begin to understand that the sun has some relevance to them as a nation and God's promises to them to preserve uh, their race forever and to judge those that curse them. That's what he's all about. Uh, right here at the middle of the, of the tree, he comes down and he makes this pronouncement. Uh, and we'll see its connection to the, um, the uh, dominion mandate here in just a second. But note verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman. Now, this woman represents Israel. This time she is clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. And on her head was that of 12 stars. God uses the planets and uh, the celestial heavens to make a promise to Israel. And that's what he is all about. That's why his face here is shining like the sun. So let's go back to Psalms 148. Psalms 148, we have what we call... We have what we call Psalms 148. Sam, there's, a, there's somebody right out the door there. You, wish you had a Bible to come on in and study, but too much to ask, I guess. Okay, this is called a celestial covenant of perpetuation. Now, it simply means that God himself has said that once he created the universe, the universe is going to always exist. 
There might be some alterations. There might be some renovation, might be some refurbishing, new heavens and new earth. But it's all the same material and it's all set up in a very similar fashion. The same pattern that God originally used, he's going to use again. Now, how do we know this? First, we have to, in order to understand this angel and his face as the sun, we've got to see this celestial covenant of perpetuation. Verse 1. Praise ye the Lord, praise ye the Lord from the heavens and the heights, his angels. Praise ye him, sun, moon, and stars. Praise him, ye heavens, the waters are above the heavens. Let them praise his name, for they were commanded, and for he commanded, and they were created. He has also established them forever and ever. He hath made a decree which shall not pass. So when you look at the, the stars in heaven, there's never going to be a time when they're not going to be there. God himself uh, has promised that they'll be there. But now, what does that have to do with Israel? He uses this same celestial covenant of perpetuation. It almost, almost sounds like a Catholic church, the celestial covenant of perpetuation. There's a good one for you. <laughs> uh, the church of the celestial covenant of perpetuation. All right, Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31, starting with verse number 31. The days are coming, says the Lord, I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And he goes on down to give this where last part of verse 34, he'll forgive their iniquity and not remember their sin anymore. But then he begins to use this covenant with the host of heaven to, uh, to make an application to Israel's perpetuity. Thus says the Lord, which gives the sun for light by day and the ordinances of the moon and stars for a light by night, divides the sea and so forth. Now, these ordinances, verse 36, if these ordinances, which we re uh, refer to as a decree in Psalms 148, um, if these ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of uh, Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. If heaven above can be measured and the foundation of the earth searched out beneath, then I will cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done. Now, simply what he is saying is, as I promised the stars, they'll always exist. Israel, look at those stars, and I promised you, you're going to always exist. And it's based on, on my character. Chapter 33, the same book. And verse 20. If ye can break my covenant of the day and covenant of the night, uh, that of course has to do with the, the sun and the earth, that there should not be day and night in their season, then may also may co my covenant be broken with David my servant, that he should not have a son to reign upon the throne. Uh, then he goes on down to verse number 22 and talks about um, uh, uh, the uh, covenant uh, or the host of heaven not being able to be numbered and the seed of David doing that as well. And, and he says pretty much the same thing um, uh, down here in uh, verse number 25. If my covenant be not with day and night, and if I have not appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth, then will I cast away the seed of Jacob. So, when we come to this particular angel and see all of this involved in him, we know what he is saying. The Jehovah God, the God of Israel, has sent this angel to remind them of his character and promises, to remind them that he has promised judgment ahead, to remind them with his face being as the sun, that Israel is going to always exist. Just as there's always going to be a sun, the moon and the stars, Israel is going to always exist. Now, let's come back to Revelation 10 again, verse 1. Tell you what, who says you can't get blood out of a turnip, tur turnip or milk a verse of Scripture dry? <laughs> but I will bet you, and I'm not a betting man, but I bet you whatever you'd want to bet, you come to that verse of Scripture, 
And you wouldn't have a clue of what all that symbolism is until we now we have brought it together and we have put it in its proper biblical and historical perspective. And now we see that this mighty angel has significance for Israel in the midst of the tribulation period, especially the remnant. Okay. Note the last part of this one verse. And his feet as pillars of fire. Now, with regard uh, uh, to this, we also want to note where he has his feet. Because uh, from here we're going to go back uh, into uh, the Old Testament and see the dominion mandate and the gesture of possession. All right? His feet, it says, were as pillars of fire. And verse 2, the last part of the verse, he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. All right, come down to verse number five. It says again, the angel I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifting his hand to heaven. Verse number eight, uh, the little book, last part of the verse, which is open in the hand of the angel, which stands upon the sea and upon the earth. Now, why in the world would God the Holy Spirit have John focus in on this angel and where in the world he's standing and how he's posturing himself here with his, with his feet. The significance is in something we've already studied, and that is Operation Footstool, the soles of your feet, having to do with possessing your possessions, uh, and this angel uh, is uh, representing the dominion mandate. Now, let's go... Uh, Let's go back to the book of Joshua, chapter 1. Joshua, chapter 1. Now, Operation Footstool is simply this summarized. God the Father has said that everything is going to be subdued under the feet of Jesus Christ. Oh, whether it's his friends or his enemies, we're all going to bow down before him one way or the other. Every knee shall bow, friend or foe, is going to say Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And uh, in the book of Joshua, he brings out his enemies, the enemy kings, and he puts them down there. And he has every soldier to, to stay, put their feet on the necks of their enemies. And that is a gesture of, of conquest, a gesture of victory. Uh, these guys are on the ground, face down in, in uh, the, uh, the dust, and uh, his soldiers have their foot on their necks. That's Operation Footstool, so, uh, subduing your enemies uh, in this act of conquest. But it's also a gesture of possession with regard to your land. And that's what this angel is doing. God is going to reclaim the earth through Christ and Israel and put his kingdom on, on this planet. So this angel comes down. He's already in the air. He puts one foot on the sea, puts one foot on the land, and he raises his hand to God, and he begins to make some declarations here about God's rule and reign on, on this planet. The return of the kingdom of God to this earth. And there's only going to be three and a half years to go before it's realized. So this angel is important. But here's where we get the gesture of possession. Chapter 1, verse 2. Moses, my servant, is dead. Arise, go over this Jordan, you and your people, uh, unto the land which I do give them, even the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given you, as I said to Moses. From the wilderness of Lebanon to the river Euphrates uh, on down to the coast, verse number four. And there shall not any man be able to stand before you all the days of your life. So uh, with, with this operation footstool means the subduing of your enemies. And with your walking on the ground means that you are now taking what belongs to them and making it your own. And that's what this angel is doing. He is symbolizing God's a return to the earth to reclaim 
this planet and put his government on it. Now let's go to the book of Genesis. Book of Genesis, chapter 1. Now, we're all familiar with this in what uh, is traditionally called the Lord's Prayer. Uh, the Lord's Prayer is really the remnant's prayer. Uh, the Lord is not, you know, going to pray this prayer. He, pray, he taught it so that the remnant could pray it in the tribulation period. Now, as Antichrist is beginning to close in on them, what are they going to pray? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. <laughs> thy will be done. I know we laugh at that, but it is. It, I, I just sense the, the haste that's in there. Thy kingdom come. Lord, it, it's got to be now. You know, you, you've seen all the actors in these clutch situations where if you don't do it now, it's curtains for us and, and, and so forth. We are going to die if you don't throw the switch now or whatever. And that's their prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom of heaven is going to be on this earth. And the remnant, a Jewish remnant, as well as the Gentile uh, uh, associated sheep from the, the nations of the world are going to pray that prayer because you're in a clutch situation. The armies of the world are now united, perhaps billions of soldiers under the command of Antichrist, and they're seeking to annihilate uh, those Jews that have refused the mark of the beast. It's called uh, the remnant. But anyway, this angel uh, is the epitome of what's called the dominion mandate. God had a kingdom on this earth that was ruled by Lucifer. Lucifer forfeited it. Forfeited it? Forfeited it. <laughs> he gave it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay you 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 know when he when he revolted okay but god then created man because what ensued in between is what's called the angelic challenge or conflict man had to be created so that lucifer could have a duel with christ as a creature inferior to him. So God made man and made Christ lower than the angels to, to be tested of the devil and fight with the devil. So there, there wouldn't be anything unfair, God, angel, this time it's angel, man. And of course, Christ still won. But what we want to look at here is what, what God did to Adam. He gave to Adam the original dominion mandate or the right to have a kingdom on earth uh, by man. Verse number 26. A couple more verses and we're done. Stay with me. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. Now, where did this guy place his right foot? On the sea. His left foot? on the land and where was he standing this massive angel in the in the air and note over the fish of the sea the fowl of the air and the cat and the cattle and over all the earth and every creeping thing you see he is posturing to show the dominion mandate he absolutely put his foot here his foot here and he stands and he swears to god that god is going to put his government on this earth and it's going to be not with adam but with the son of Adam, Jesus Christ, um, through Mary, of course, uh, and, that, and that man is going to have dominion over this earth. And that's why his feet are doing it. It's the gesture of possession. It is the gesture of, of conquest. God created man in his image, male and female. God blessed them, verse 28. And he said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. 